All right, AP Statistics. So let's take a look at uh, Chapter 6 here. This video is going to cover um, several things. It's going to be repeated a little bit in the beginning, and we're going to end with some stuff that's uh, kind of new and kind of really, really essential to the entire class. So the first thing up is um, the name of the chapter is the standard deviation um, as a measuring stick and uh, focusing on z-scores. So we're going to learn all about that. But first, I want to do a quick recap of what it means to shift or change data. Um, so let's say that that everyone in the uh, all AP stats classes that I have, so it's roughly, uh, I don't know, somewhere around 89 um, students, runs the 200 meter dash. And let's say that the mean of the group is 30 seconds. The median, we'll use a capital N for median, is 32 seconds. And that's a 30, and it kind of looks like a 36, it's 30. And the IQR, is 8. The standard deviation, which we usually just use in S, the standard deviation is 6. And the minimum score, let's say that the lowest that somebody did was 12. So that was uh, somebody that's really fast, probably like Cooper. Cooper probably did a 200 meter dash in 12 seconds. And let's say that the first quartile, so this the first quartile, the so 25th percentile, was 27. And again, the, uh, that's the 25% of data would have been less than 27 seconds. And um, let's talk about your particular score. So let's say your, whoever you are, uh, other than Cooper, because you know he got that 12, but your score, your particular score was 35. So you got a 35. So whoever is watching this, you got a 35. All right, so if the first adjustment I do is I just I say, oh, my stopwatch was off a little bit. I accidentally messed something up. I have to add, um, and let's let's name this variable. So this, um, let's name this W. So W is this time you got in the 200 yard dash. So let's say I made a mistake with my stopwatch. I say, you know what, guys, I'm sorry I made a mistake. I have to add 10 seconds to everybody's score. So if I add 10 seconds to everybody's score, so the mean gets affected by additions. So that would go up to 40. The median gets affected by additions. So that would go up to 42. S measures of spread, like IQR and standard deviation, we would, re would remain completely unchanged when all you're doing is adding. The min would, of course, go up to 22. The Q1 is a measure of position, so it would go up to 37. And your particular score would obviously become a 45. Now, let's say that um, I wanted to estimate what everybody's 400-yard dash time would be. So that means I'd have to multiply everybody's score by 2. So I'd have to double everybody's score, um, time if I'm going to establish what I think you can do the 400 in, if this is the 200. So the mean would be 60 seconds. Median would be uh, 64 seconds. The IQR and standard deviation are measures of spread, and they do get affected by multiplication. So that would be 16, and that would be 12. Uh, the mid would be 24. The first quartile would be 27, so that would be 27 times 2 is 54. And your particular score would be a 70. Um, so that's what happens when you double. All right, let's say that the last thing we're going to do is we're going to change all the data by timesing by 2 and then adding 20 seconds. So why we would do that, I'm not quite sure. Maybe we're trying to get some estimation or something. So here we're going to double and add 20. So mean is affected by both, and same with median. So I'd have to double it and add 20. So that would become 80. Uh, median, double it and add 20. That would become 84. The IQ and standard deviation would only get doubled. So they would say it's 16 and 12. They would not get affected by the addition of the 20 at all. Min would be would get affected by both. So that would double to uh, original scores 12, double 24, then add 20 would be 44. Q1 would be affected by both. So that's double to 54, add 20 to 74. And your particular score would be, again, doubled. That would be the um, 35. Doubled would be 70, plus 20 would be 90. So just kind of a quick showing of, of how data gets affected. Addition affects only measures of center and individual values, not measures of spread. That's IQR and standard deviation. And range falls into that category of not being affected by addition or subtraction as well. Doubling affects everybody. And if you're going to do two things at once, only the addition would affect 
I'm sorry, only the multiplication would affect measures of spread. Everything else would also get the addition of 20. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of that. So let's use this same data and the talk about standardized score. So we had, remember, we had a mean of 30 and a standard deviation. I want to double check what that was real quick. Standard deviation was 6. So let's talk about an individual person because we want to talk about values in terms of how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. So let's talk about um, Dave. So let's say that Dave um, ran the 200 yard dash in 40 seconds. So what would his, how many standard deviations above? He was obviously above the mean, so he, in terms of running, being high would actually be bad or worse. So he was a little bit higher than the mean, but how much? I want a measurement of how much higher. Yeah, you could say he's 10 seconds higher, but I want to measure that in standard deviations. So to do that, i got to find the difference between Dave's score and the mean, so obviously I would subtract to find the difference, and that would be 10. So I did Dave's score minus the mean. I'm going to divide by the standard deviation. So this is going to tell me how many standard deviations he was above the mean. So 10 divided by 6 is about 1.6 repeating, so I'm just going to round that off to 1.67. So this is um, what we call a z-score, okay? A z-score is and it doesn't mean z equals, so we just say z score. z score is how many standard deviations, how many standard deviations a value is above or below, because you could be negative if he did better, you know what I mean, or lower than the mean, above or below the mean. Now you may say, well, why, why do we do this? What the state, what a z-score does is it gives us like a universal measuring stick. So now I can compare anything. I could literally compare apples to oranges. I can compare any two things if I look at their z-scores. So it does, because remember when you do this, think about it, 40 minus 30 is 10 seconds. The standard deviation is measured in seconds. So the seconds cancel. There's actually no units on z-scores. The units is standard deviations above or below the mean. And since this is a positive value, that would obviously be above. So the z-scores enable us to have a universal measuring stick so we can compare any values together, okay? So um, we call this standardizing, standardizing, okay? So standardizing allows us literally to compare apples to oranges, okay? Um, in the last unit, we kind of learned how to calculate standard deviation and to recognize that it describes the spread of the data. It tells you how much, how spread out your data is. We now show how using the standard deviation as a unit of measurement provides us with a universal yardstick. The yardstick enables comparisons of widely different measurements. More important later on, it allows us to decide if the results of a study are unusually different from what we might have expected. So you have to understand that these idea of z-scores is the very essence of statistical inference, which is extremely, extremely important. So this idea of z-scores is probably one of the most underlying concepts of all of statistics. Okay, so um, hopefully that main idea kind of makes sense to you, and we're going to do some examples um, shortly here that will have this idea of z-scores make sense. Let's just do one more example so you guys can kind of get a feel for this. Let's bring in Jimmy. Okay, let's say that Jimmy ran it in 25 seconds. Okay, so what is Jimmy's z-score? So we would do the difference between Jimmy and the mean. So it's uh, Jimmy's score minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So we would get 25 minus 30 is negative 5 divided by 6. So negative 5 divided by 6 is about negative 0.83. So that means that Jimmy did was, the negative tells us he was below the mean, so he was 0.83 standard deviations below the mean. 0.83 standard deviations below the mean. So we're going to come back to this idea of z-scores, but it's really important. I'm going to kind of write the formula for a z-score right here. A z-score is your particular value, some value that you got minus the mean, you always subtract the mean, divided by the standard deviation. And that's going to give you what we call a z-score, or an also known as a standardized score. And what we mean by standardized is it allows us to compare 
any two things, even if their units are different, even if the units are different, I can compare them. Okay, so let's kind of um, give uh, some examples. Okay, so let's say that we have um, an elk, all right, and then we also have a deer. Okay, and I'm making most of this information up, so don't criticize me too much. Let's say that we know that the average elk weighs 225 pounds, okay, with a standard deviation of 18 pounds, okay? And we know that the average deer has an average weight of 205 pounds, and hopefully, no, that's not that's a pounds, not a one right there. I don't want you thinking here. And has a standard deviation of 25 pounds. So just kind of from observations, deer have a larger standard deviation, which probably means they're spread out a little bit more. Their score, their their average weight could vary a little bit more for a deer. They're about 25 pounds away from average versus elks are 18. But anyway, let's say that. Um, we want to know what's weirder. We found an elk that weighs 236 pounds. And then we also found a deer, a specific deer, that weighs 200 and, uh, let's see here, 36 pounds as well. Okay, so they're both weigh the same. So we want to know who's weirder. Which one is the most, uh, is the uh, oddest, I guess, animal, elk or deer? They both weigh the same, so we can't, but they're elks and deers, so we can't say, well, they weigh the same. They're both the same. Well, see, z-scores allow us to compare elks and deers. So we have to find the z-score for this elk. So that'd be 236, that's the his actual weight, I'm assuming it's a he, minus the average for elks, which is 225, divided by the standard deviation for elks, which is 18. So this particular elk that we just found was, let me do the math real quick here, 0 0.61 standard deviations above the mean. Okay, so, or, so this elk was above average weight, not a crazy above average, but 0 0.61 is above average, okay? So let's check out this deer, though. This deer, again, 236 was its weight, minus it was 205 was its average divided by 25 was its standard deviation. So 236 divided by 205 uh, divided by 25 is point, I had to have done something wrong here. Oh, I did, <laughs> 236 divide, uh, minus 205 divided by 25 would be 1.24. 1.24. So what we noticed was this deer and elk weighed the same. And I want to know who's more overweight. They're obviously both over the average for their particular species. But who's more overweight? Well, it's going to be the deer. The deer is 1.24 standard deviations above normal, above what's normal for a deer, versus an elk was only 0.61 standard deviations above what was normal for an elk. So the deer is much more fatter, I guess you could say, or much more overweight. So that's, that's one easy case where z-scores allow us to compare two different species that have two different averages. Because, you know, you can't say, well, they're, they're, they're both fat, they're both 236, they're both overweight. Well, who's most more overweight, I guess, is the question that that allows us to answer. So next, I want to shift gears a little bit here and talk about models, okay, and what we mean by models here, okay. Um, at its heart, inference involves looking at a sample data and trying to guess what's actually going on in its population. So let's think of a, a big population here. Let's think if we were talking about the weights of men, okay, the weights of men. So, um, you know, how many, what's the population would be all men, okay, so maybe we're talking, let's specifically, weights of U.S. men, so, you know, population is still pretty big, so the population, I don't know, there's approximately 3 billion, or 300 million people in the United States, so about 150 million people, or men, okay, that's a lot, big population, population is everybody, and inference, the idea of inference, we want to make kind of a guess or an idea about that population, we obviously can't get to everybody, so we just choose a sample, and we take a look at that particular sample, okay, so, um, 
It is vitally important that students be able to see that such comparisons involve known, observed data on one hand and unknown or unknowable facts about the world on the other hand. So you, you got to understand, we have the sample here, okay? And we know our sample. We actually looked at our sample and we know, you know, it has n particular men in it and maybe that was 100 men in our sample. And, and we, we can actually see that sample. We can actually get outcomes from that sample. I mean, that sample is real, okay, versus the population. The population, I mean, if you think about it, it's impossible to know everything about that population. Um, we can't actually calculate the mean or the standard deviation or the median or any of that stuff about a population. It's, it's just not real. It's just, I mean, it's real, the population, but it's unknowable as to what those values are. So we hope that a sample could help us make predictions about the population. Okay, so to help us make a distinction between the sample and the population, we have adopted the term model to re represent the images of theoretical perfection as distinguished from what we, for, as distinguished from what we observe. Um, so we have to understand the population is kind of uh, theoretical because we never really get to it. We just kind of theorize about it. Okay, the sample we get to, we actually see that sample. So anyway, when we're working with the sample, we first can calculate the mean, and that would be x bar. In a population, we don't know the mean, so we actually have a symbol for the mean. It's mu. Okay, it's actually pronounced mu. Okay, like mu, kind of like a cow's mewing. Okay, I guess that's mu, 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 whatever, mu. You get the idea. But it's like a U with a little. It's a Greek letter U with a little extra tail on the front there. And we also have the standard deviation. Okay, and when we're working with a sample, that standard deviation is S, and we can actually see that it's real. We could calculate it. But in a population, in this theoretical model, right, that's what we call it. It's just a model. It's not, no one knows if it's right. It's just a model. We have this other value here called sigma. And sigma is the standard deviation in a um, population model or something that's theorized. And it's a little kind of like an O with a little extra tail on the top there. Okay, so that is the uh, standard sigma, you know, standard we use for, or symbol we use for um, standard deviation of the population. So you have to understand this is a sample. S samples produced statistics. And I know I'm really cramping the screen here. Statistics. Okay, that's what samples produce. They produce statistics that we could actually measure, we can actually get to, we can actually see them. They're real. And uh, populations produce what we call parameters. And again, I, I'm just trying to distinguish between all these different terms that we're going to be using this particular unit and the rest of the year. And parameters are coming from the population. They're more theoretical and they're more a model. Okay, so um, we got statistics, we got mean x bar or standard deviation s, we got parameters from the population, that's this mu and sigma. And then um, when we're talking about the the, his, the actual distribution, when we have a sample, we can actually make a histogram. We can actually see a histogram. And we've all dealt with histograms already this year. You know, you got these boxes here, and you're going to see how the data fits. Is it skewed left, skewed right, unimodal, symmetric, bell-shaped? When we're working the population, we don't actually, we don't know what goes into each bin. You know, with histograms, we say, hey, we saw five people in this bin. We saw 22 people in this bin. With a model, with the parameters, with something that's theoretical, we, we don't really know. So we don't really use histograms. We use, we use curves because we don't know exactly amounts in the bins. So we might use a curve and say that, well, it, it kind of would look like this, but we're not really sure. We don't exactly know the exact amount of the bins because it's just the population. So that's kind of histograms or for samples. It's a real statistics. And then our model here is using, you know, uh, curves here. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the idea here. So, uh, you know, trying to just get the idea between sample and or population. So a sample or statistics, they're real. Okay. We observed them. We actually saw this data happen. We know the mean. We know the standard deviation. We can use the histogram to make the boxes. 
population, those are parameters. They're kind of imagined, to be honest with you. They're not necessarily real. They're theoretical. It's a model, and models aren't always right, okay? They, they try to be right, but a famous statistician actually once said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And, and we get these parameters, okay? And again, that's uh, mu, it's a theorized mean, sigma, a theorized standard deviation from the population and, and the curves here for a, a, instead of a histogram. So from the population, somewhere out there is the true average. We'll never, ever know it, but our sample could try to predict it. We'll never know the population standard deviation sigma, but in our sample, we can try to predict it. So hopefully the, uh, the idea of that kind of makes sense. And um, one of the most famous models that we're going to learn about is what we call the normal model. Now, there's many models out there, and we're going to learn a lot, uh, you know, a lot about them. But the most famous model is called the normal model. And the normal model kind of looks like this. It's really important to understand the normal model. It is perfectly symmetric and perfectly bell-shaped, okay? Now, no data in the world actually looks like this. And the idea is, right smack dab in the center is the, um, this is a model, so we're going to say the mean. So I'm going to put up here the x bar so you understand that it's the mean, but it's really mu because it's, it's what's happening in this perfect world. And in this perfect world, we um, vary, of course, but the normal model says, hey, it's normal for data to have a lot of data in the middle. Most people would fall somewhere near, near that mean, or most data would fall near that mean. And um, very few data would fall to the far right, and very few data to the far left. These are called the tails, and the tails would be very small, not a whole lot of data out on them. And the idea of the normal model is that we can go plus one standard deviation, that's sigma, or we can go out plus two standard deviations, or we can go out plus three standard deviations, or we can go down one standard deviation, down two standard deviations, and down three standard deviations. And it's very, 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 very rare to ever be more than three standard deviations. So we only make the model go to plus three and minus three. And uh, in class, we're going to talk about why that is so impossible to be um, more than three standard deviations. And uh, that's the normal model, okay? So it's got the mean in the center, and it goes up 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3 standard deviations. And remember, what do we call these standard deviations away from the mean? Z-scores. So that's how I'm connecting it all back to what we learned in the beginning. Z-scores are how far or how many standard deviations you are away from the means. This would be one plus one z-score, plus two z-score, plus three z-scores, negative one, negative two, negative three. So basically, a z-score of three or more is extremely rare. In fact, it never really happens. And if it did, something really weird is going on. And same thing with minus three standard deviations below the mean would be really, really weird. So that's kind of the most famous model right there, the normal model. And we're going to learn a lot more, but just understanding that basic idea of the normal model and then getting this idea down of models and, and the difference between samples versus populations and then you know getting the idea of a z-score understood and what it does for us what it tells us how many standard deviations you are above or below the mean and how weird you could be or how far away from the mean you could be and then don't forget about really understanding the idea of what shifting data can do whether you're adding multiplying or, or doing both so we'll uh, do some more stuff in class tomorrow to uh, kind of put all this stuff together